morning. I'm Ann Juris. I'm in the microbiology department, and I'm here uh, to talk to you about urinary tract infections. As you can see in the second slide, I've outlined the objectives for the lecture. Uh, mostly what we'll be talking about today is cystitis and pyelonephritis, and um, three types of UTIs. So one can divide UTIs into uncomplicated community-acquired UTIs, complicated, and catheter-related UTIs. And for each of those, we'll be talking about the populations at risk, the clinical presentation, and the types of the main types of bacterial species that um, are associated with each one of them. Uh, we'll focus on a couple of the pathogens. There's a uropathogenic E. coli called UPEC and Proteus mirabilis, and then a few others. But for the most part, we'll be talking in general terms in terms of the bacteria that cause them. Um, UTIs are a huge problem in hospital settings, and so we'll talk a little bit about nosocomial pathogens and how biofilms contribute to U UTI infections in hospitals. And then we'll end with talking about how the laboratory diagnosis of UTI is made. So this slide shows you uh, the anatomical site where we're at, and we'll start with cystitis, which is a bladder infection, and normally uh, that occurs when bowel flora or vaginal flora are introduced into the bladder. A more serious infection is pyelonephritis, and that occurs when infection ascends from the bladder, or if there's hematogenous spread um, during a systemic infection with an organism. UTIs are actually quite important in terms of their incidence, morbidity, mortality, and the costs they uh, put upon our health system. In the United States, it's estimated that there's 14 million visits per year for USI, which is very, per UTIs, which is very expensive, over $4 billion estimated per year. Um, it's also a problem with, with pediatrics, with 10% of children having one or more episodes of UTI annually. Uh, in the hospital setting, they're very serious infections, and they can lead to things like shock. Often the pa patients have underlying conditions and other serious problems, and so they really complicate the management of the patient. Um, and one thing that we'll talk about as we go along is that antibiotic resistance is a serious concern, and in the case of anarcoxide, which we'll talk about at the end, is a, a big, really big problem. So the urine um, is actually a very good growth media, but the urinary tract is sterile. And that's because in vivo there are many host defenses that help defend this site. For example, pH of the urine, if it's less than 5.5, that eliminates a lot of bacteria, and there are many acids that are responsible for that. TAM horsefall protein, which you've probably heard about, acts as sort of like a slime in the urinary tract and helps keep pathogens from adhering to epithelial cells. Lactoferrin chelates iron, takes up iron so that um, organisms don't have iron to grow and also can be bactericidal. And then there's many antimicrobial peptides that are brought in during infection uh, that can defend against uh, UTI pathogens. But probably one of the most important defenses of the urinary tract is the fact that urine flows unidirectionally and that helps wash out the urinary tract and keeps um, the pathogen load low. So the things that can compromise UTI defenses include volume depletion, sexual intercourse can bring pathogens in, anything that obstructs the urinary tract, such as prostate enlargement, anything that impedes that urinary flow can cause a problem. Catheterization can bring in pathogens, um, reflux into the bladder, abnormal reflux into the bladder in some people, it's an inherited condition, can cause an increased risk of UTI. And then there's many metabolic states um, that increase one's risk for UTI. You can map the um, risk of UTI or the incidence of UTI over one's lifetime. Early during uh, life, boys have more UTIs than girls, but they're high in both categories or both genders. And then it's pretty much a problem for females. Um, girls in preschool have a little blip in UTIs. When women or young teenagers become sexually active, there's an increase in the um, occurrence of cystitis. During pregnancy, UTIs are a big problem. But as people grow older, you can, as you can see, uh, UTIs become a problem in males, and that correlates with the development of prostate disease. Okay, so we'll start with talking in more detail about uncomplicated UTI, or community-acquired UTI. And most often, this uh, will occur in women, and the risk factors for women include things like sexual activity, um, use of birth control, and women uh, who are older and also pregnant all have higher risks of uncomplicated UTI. Again, cystitis is a bladder infection, and the patient will present with dysuria, which is low-volume urines, frequent urination, superpubic pain, if this person is sexually active, then one thing that you should consider is whether or not they have an STI, because many of these um, manifestations are similar to what one might have with a chlamydia infection or a gonorrhea infection, which are not infections of the bladder, but instead infections of the urethra or the cervix. Um, and community-acquired UTI can ascend to become pyelonephritis, which is a more serious infection, and in that case the patient may complain of flank pain, um, and they may have fever, nausea, vomiting chills, it's a more systemic type of manifestation and the bacteria can actually get into the bloodstream in the case of hyalonephritis. So the major players of uncomplicated UTI are bowel flora, 
and the biggest group of um, bacteria in one's gut that are not anaerobes, but that are facultative, facultatively anaerobes, are um, the Enterobacteriaceae family. And of those, E. coli is the number one member of the intestine. And so E. coli is the most common cause of uncomplicated UTI. I've listed below E. coli some other species that belong to the Enterobacteriaceae that you may see on your lab reports that um, often cause uncomplicated UTI. Probably the second most common cause is a gram-positive organism called Staphylococcus saprophyticus, and that's one that's been adapted to the urinary tract. I have a picture of the oxidase test on the slide, and that's a test that's used to help identify members of the Enterobacteriaceae family. They're oxidase negative compared to Pseudomonas, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which is oxidase positive, but is also a gram-negative rod that can be found in the gut. Okay, so we'll talk in more detail about the E. coli then that cause UTI, and what we call them are the Europathogenic E. coli. They're not your garden variety E. coli, but instead they are E. coli that have acquired virulence factors, and um, these particular virulence factors have adapted them for the urinary tract. The way these virulence factors moved in was by way of pathogenicity islands that integrated into the chromosome, and um, it happened to certain clones of E. coli, and you know that because they, the UPEC belonged to certain OH serotypes, and these are evidence of clones that acquired factors and then became successful as, U, as urinary tract pathogens. So one of the virulence factors that's important for UPEC are the type 1 pili, and they have been shown to be important for colonizing the bladder, and they cause exfoliation of bladder cells when they do that, which helps elicit an immune response. Um, these type 1 fimbria go, undergo phase variation. They turn on and off just spontaneously, and when they're off, the organism can ascend more easily to the kidney. UPEC also make P pili or PAP pili, and they adhere to the P blood group, the digalactoside receptors, and they have been shown to be important for colonization of the kidneys. UPEC also make two, to two toxins, the homolysin and the cytonecrotizing factor, the CNF toxins, and these contribute to some of the damage that occurs to tissues during UTI. On the next slide, what you'll see are some uh, photos that show uh, cells that are colonized by UPEC. On the bottom, on the right, then, you have adherence to uroepithelial cells by type 1 and P fimbria. Above that, the cells are beginning to exfoliate, and then above that, neutrophils begin to move in, so the host responds to infection. Um, as it moves up into the kidney, then, more damage occurs, and toxins can cause damage to the glomeruli and epithelial cells in that location. Staphylococcus saprophyticus, I told you, is the number two cause of community-acquired UTI. Um, in your textbook, it says up to 20% of cases. When you actually look at the data, it's usually around 5 to 10% of the uncomplicated UTI is due to staph saprophyticus. And I have two surveys here to show you that. So E. coli is number one in both, both cases, and staph saprophyticus is about 5% of the cases that come in. The other, other organisms I have listed, Proteus morabilis and Clebnumo, are Enterobacteriaceae, and then we have Enterococcus, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and that is a gram-positive organism. So back to Staph saprophyticus, um, as it is a staph, they're gram-positive cocci and clusters. If you'll remember from the staph lecture uh, in one of the skin lectures, they um, grow on blood auger. Staph auris is the big pathogen among the staph, um, staphylococci, and the, it has a yellowish color, whereas the other staphylococci have a whitish color on an auger plate. You will remember that the catalase test is used to identify staphylococci um, and to, to distinguish it from streptococci. And then once you have a suspected staphylococcus, the coagulase test is used to identify staph aureus. The coagulase negative staphi include staph epidermidis and staph, staph saprophyticus. And then in the laboratory, they use noble bias and then to identify staph saprophyticus and distinguish it from staph epi. Okay, so. Um, before we leave uncomplicated UTIs, and I want to mention recurrent uncomplicated UTIs because these plague many women. It's a real problem. About 25% of women with uh, UTIs have them again and again. And we don't know why, but it seems to be a combination of the three factors that are shown in the circles. The environment seems to be part of it in that women with recurrent UTIs, and some studies have shown to have a high rate of E. coli colonizing the vagina and intestine, um, a higher colonization load, so that may play a role. Uh, usually it's the same strain, so it's possible that some strains are better at causing recurrent UTI than others. Perhaps they're actually not being cleared, but they're persisting in low levels, um, or they're just good at reinfecting the host. And then host genetics are also implicated in that there's some evidence that non-secretors are of a higher risk for um, recurrent UTI. So this is an active area of study, and part of the problem for you is that women with recurrent UTIs then often are in trouble um, in terms of developing a strain that is highly resistant to antibiotics because you treat them and then they get infected again and during that time in between they may become resistant to the antibiotic that you used. 
Okay, we're going to move to complicated and catheter-associated UTI. So these are what you would, you would see in the hospital or people who have underlying disorders, um, and they're a little bit harder to diagnose and to manage. So catheter-associated uh, UTIs are a huge problem in hospital, and they are hard to diagnose because, again, the, the uh, symptoms are very vague. Fever, leukocytosis, um, white blood cells in the urine, and in both these cases there are other problems with the patient as well. So those bacteria that are most often associated with complicated and catheter-associated UTI are listed on the slide. So again, we have the Enterobacteriaceae, the oxidase-negative, gram-negative rods that are, occur in high numbers in your gut. They're listed here, and you'll notice that E. coli is no longer number one. Uh, it is not the most common cause of these infections. Uh, later on, you're going to learn about gastrointestinal pathogens that belong to this group, and um, I talked to Dr. Thiel, and we decided to put this on the slide so that when you review all of this in years to come, that you can put these pathogens in with the same group. But for the UTI pathogens, they're on your right. Other species that can cause these more serious uh, complicated UTIs then are Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staphylococcus aureus, and Enterococcus, and then yeast can also be a uh, causative agent. Many of these are very good at forming biofilms on catheters, um, and that's part of their success in this setting. If you'll remember, biofilms are communities of bacteria that adhere to each other due to the production of extracellular polymers, carbohydrates. Um, they communicate to each other by secreting chemicals that they have receptors for, and they're a way that bacteria can avoid the host response. Um, they're protected from antibiotics, and they're dangerous because they can detach then and get in the bloodstream to um, seed other sites and cause sepsis. Some of the microbes that are particularly good at biofilm formation are listed on the right, and we'll be talking about just a few of them um, briefly here. Here are, it was a survey of 106 biofilms, and you can see the different organisms that were isolated, and often biofilms are mixed with more than one species, as you can see in the middle uh, column. So the ones then that uh, I want you to pay attention to, to then is going to be Proteus mirabilis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We'll review Staph aureus just a little bit and Staph epidermidis, and then we'll talk about Enterococcus, which you haven't had yet. Proteus mirabilis is very well adapted for complicated UTI. Um, this was a, a survey of what percent of UTI was caused by Proteus mirabilis on the x-axis, and on the y is whether or not the person was catheterized or not. And as you can see, catheterization results in a higher percentage of UTIs caused by this pathogen. It's a very interesting organism in the laboratory. Um, on an auger plate, it, causes, it produces what is called swarming motility. So if you look at the auger plate on your right, there are only two colonies of Proteus present on this plate, uh, on this plate and they're the center of each bullseye. But what happens is they produce, they, they quit dividing, and they produce these swarmer cells. So if you look on the next slide on your right in panel B, those are proteases that, um, bacteria that have stopped dividing and gotten very long. And they produce like 10 to the fourth flagella per bacterium compared to about 20 to 50, and that makes them really good at swimming. And so the thought is that by doing this, they have a much easier time going against the flow of urine and getting to the kidneys. So we think that swarming, the swarming phenotype, is actually a virulence factor for this pathogen. I'm going to go back two slides and uh, go back to the slide called Proteus morales, and the third bullet says it produces urease. That is also a virulence factor. So if you move forward, there's a picture of two flasks of synthetic urine. Uh, in one, no urease was added, purified urease, and the other urease was added. And you can see that when urease is added, the pH goes up because it'll break down urea to ammonia and CO2, and that causes precipitation of minerals in the urine and is highly associated with kidney stones. And here's a review of some of the calculi um, that can be isolated from people. So Proteus mirabilis is a major cause of complicated UTI. It's a major cause of pyelonephritis in that population of patients, and it's also associated with kidney stones. 